Have y'all enjoyed church this morning? Yeah. Amen. I have. I have. God is, God is up to something, you know. The Lord is up to something. It's very easy to look around us and get discouraged and see all the things that's going on. And, and we should, you know, there are things happening in, this, in, in, in the world around us and in, particularly in our nation that actually should make us angry. It really should make us angry. And actually it should make us angry enough to want to do something about it. And that means joining with God and doing what God instructs us to do. I've come to the conclusion, and, and I don't mind saying this, I, and, I, and if, if I'm wrong, I'll be wrong, but I honestly believe that the man in the White House is there as a plant of the devil. And he's an instrument. He has not been. He could have been an instrument of God. But he's become an instrument of the Antichrist. And so, therefore, you know, that, that's, we still have to pray for him. We have to pray for him. But my problem is not with him. My problem, first and foremost, is with the church. Because the church put him there. Because they didn't vote. And if they, it, it, you know, people that didn't vote are people in the church that voted for him. Couldn't have prayed. The second thing I'm mad at is where is Congress? And where are the preachers? The only voice you hear rising up against anything out there is Franklin Graham. Franklin Graham. Where are these mega church preachers at? Building transgender bathrooms in their church? Now, that's what, what today's message is about, okay? So I'm going to have to stop because I do get angry. Uh, but 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, just so you know where I stand. <laughs> Real quick. Amen. Amen. That was free. We're not going to pay Dan for that. <laughs> Although it was good, we're just not going to pay for it. <laughs> right on, brother. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But you say, I, me, but I am a chosen generation. I am a royal priesthood. I am a holy nation. I am his special person that I may proclaim the praises of him who called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Boy, that got a big shout, didn't it? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Has anybody in here been called out of darkness? And are you now in His marvelous light? Yes. And have you found any light that's been any greater than the light that Jesus is? No. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to bless the Word this morning. Anoint us to preach your Word under your strong anointing, a powerful anointing, that it may penetrate our hearts and souls and minds and bring forth good fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. What sticks out in your mind about... When you, and I, I mentioned this one Wednesday night Bible study, but, but if you can, out in a group of people, you can normally spot a Muslim, right? Because of their dress. Uh, you can spot a Hindu because of the dot on their forehead. You can actually spot a Jehovah's Witness. Matter of fact, I had two come by my house this past week. Uh, they had their suits on and they uh, right, knocked on my door and they said, we know you weren't expecting us, but we're here, we'd like to talk to you about the Bible. 
I said, are you Jehovah's Witness? They said, yes, we are. I said, I'm a spirit-filled Christian. I speak in tongues. Would you still like to talk to me? They said, sir, you have a good day. Can we leave? Can, can, we, can we leave a pamphlet? And I said, no, you just take it with you. And that was all there was to it. <laughs> so anyway, they went on their way. You start telling you speak in tongues, and they normally will get a little bit afraid of you and walk away. But uh, anyway, but they're known by, because they get out and go door to door. You can spot them. The Mormon. Guys in suits on bicycles. Okay? The Christian. Oh, he's the guy that, that uh, I cut off on the interstate and he gave me the bird. Oh, he, he that Christian, that's the, that, that, that's the guy that, that uh, you know, he, he gets aggravated and, and he lets his language overtake him and he, yeah, I can spot him. Boy, did it get quiet in here. What is the Christian known for? They are? Have you read Facebook lately? There's the, the Christian says, I don't believe in this and I don't believe in that and I don't believe in that and I don't believe in that and I don't believe in that. And you say, well, what do you believe in? Well, I don't know. Go ask my preacher. See if he can tell you. We find, <laughs> we find here, you know, I'm not advocating here this morning the need to dress to draw attention or to put a dot on our forehead or, or to put, be some strange looking character out there. But our morals should certainly be different than those of the world. Thank you for those two amens. We should be set apart because Jesus said that we are a chosen generation. Now, if we're a chosen generation, that means we are chosen for this day, for this hour that you and I are living in, and there's nothing that Congress can do that should get us to the point that it causes us to lose our salvation because we are here in this time period because God said you can do it. We can do it. We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a son, a daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not advocating all this other stuff, but our character must show the true character and nature of a God who loves us, a father who is good, a son who gave his life for us, a cross that he died on. I'm a whole lot more excited than you are. You see, peculiar is what it reads in the King James Version. It says, a peculiar person. Well, they didn't really have a, a, a word to translate peculiar when they translated the King James Version, and so they used the word peculiar. And peculiar means strange or odd or unusual. And that can apply to a chosen generation. That can apply to us, but... The proper translation is belonging exclusively to a group. When peculiar, it means belonging exclusively to a group. Who do you belong to? Who has you? Who has your attention? Who has your resources? Who has your possessions? Who has your heart? Who has your home? Who has your health? Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? We walk around here sometimes like we don't even belong to God. We belly ache and moan and groan and complain and go over this I hurt here, I hurt there. And Jesus is sitting there saying, I am the healer. I am the one who healed all of your diseases. And all we know to do is complain and belly ache and moan and groan. And you say, but pastor, I do hurt, I do, I hurt, I hurt. I understand that. But I want to tell you something this morning. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But denial is denying things that you see and saying it's not there. 
So I'm not asking you to deny what exists. But I am asking you to believe for what doesn't exist. Denial is saying that uh, there's something wrong with me and it doesn't exist. That's denial. But when you say, yeah, my spine might be crooked, but in the name of Jesus Christ, my spine is healed through the blood of Jesus because my faith sees it healed in Jesus' name. That's strange. That's peculiar. That looks a little bit different than the way the world treats things. And so the Christian has got to be set apart. We can't blend in with the world and the world doesn't need to blend in with the church. That's one of the problems of today's church. It looks too much like the world. And that's why the church, many of them are growing like like, uh, leaps and bounds and all this is because they've painted the church to look like the world and you can go to that church and you don't feel conviction. You don't feel, you know, you're, you're just right at home. You're just right at home. Well, brother, it was home this morning here at RCF because I felt the Holy Spirit here. Because I know that I'm in the presence of Almighty God. I, Amanda sent a little text to me and said, I see a, a great throne and a great light permeating from that throne. And there's peace and there's tranquility around this throne. And I probably didn't throw all the words in there that she had there. But that's exactly what I was feeling when we was worshiping this morning. I felt that peace and that tranquility. I felt that comfort and that joy. And only God can give me that only the Holy Spirit can give to me. I can't find that out there. I can't find that at work. I can't find that in the lawn. I can't find that anywhere else the only place I find the Holy Spirit coming and quenching my thirst is when I get in His presence you've heard that old song says looking for love in all the wrong places well, we got a bunch of Christians looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for God in all the wrong places, looking for the presence of the Holy Spirit in all the wrong places. We're a peculiar people. We're part of an exclusive group. We're, we're part of the Barney Fuss Esquire Club. Coffee, tea, or punch. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I want to look at four things. Four things that makes us exclusive. A peculiar person. or God needs a people who are trained in God's school. God needs people who are trained in His school. Because you see, when you get trained in God's school, it gets you ready for spiritual warfare. Now, we're talking about on June the 5th launching and igniting our community for Jesus. Can I tell you, it's going to require a lot of warfare in the Spirit to see this city saved for Jesus Christ. It's going to require some intercession. It's going to require some prayer that's going to go beyond your little five-minute apology every day. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin today. It's going to require more than just your little touchdown prayer at the altar. What do you mean touchdown prayer? I'm not talking about football. I'm talking about when you, you come down to the altar and your knees hit just like a touchdown and then you back up. You wasn't in there long enough to say thank you, Jesus. If we're going to win our community for Jesus Christ, if you're going to win your family for Jesus Christ, if you're going to overcome your sickness, if you're going to overcome your illness, then we're going to have to get in tune with what God wants. We're going to have to be involved in spiritual warfare. It's going to require some extra time on our part. It's going to require a commitment in serving Jesus Christ above and beyond whatever we've already done. And I'm not talking about works that's going to get it done. I'm talking about praying in the Spirit. I'm talking about listening to the voice of God. I'm talking about hearing what God is saying and then doing what He tells us to do. And that happens more than just on Sunday morning. That happens more than just on Sunday morning. That happens every day of the week. If you'll get in tune with God, He will give you instruction for that day. Moses was trained in God's school on the backside of the desert for 40 years. He became well acquainted with the wilderness. 
He exhibited self-control. He knew the deep things of God. How many of you can say this morning, I know the deep things of God? The only way you're going to find the deep things of God and to know the deep things of God is to get in God's school and let Him teach you. I'm not talking about earning a degree from any university, college, or anything like that. Those are great. We may even do that around here one day. That's not what I'm talking about, and that's all fine and well. I'm talking about getting on your knees before God and letting God train you, letting God teach you, hearing the voice of God to where you don't have to depend on somebody else to give you a word because you heard a word from the Holy Spirit today. Now, giving words is okay, and God uses us in that. But 99% of the time is to confirm something that God's already told you. You're already aware of it. You're just looking for confirmation. But if you're always just going around because somebody needs to give me a word. I'm going to go over here to this church because they give good words. Well, is this not a good word? Is this not a good word? You see, we got to get in that place where Jesus taught his disciples to be meek. Not to flip somebody off when they get cut off on the interstate. And you got an RCF bumper sticker on your car. That's why I don't order bumper stickers. I don't want God following some of y'all around. Y'all do want me to tell the truth, don't you? <laughs> so don't come and say, Preacher, we need to have bumper stickers. <laughs> so forget that, okay? <laughs> yeah. And if you're going to badmouth somebody, please don't put that you go to church at RCF on Facebook. Please. We're trying to promote godly things here. <laughs> I'm being funny, but I'm also telling you the truth. You see, Jesus taught his disciples to be meek, to turn the other cheek. Jesus taught his disciples to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Jesus taught his disciples to be pure in heart. Now, did they always meet that pl- get to that place? No. We found where they made me- plenty of mistakes in disobeying every one of these. But, he, he, but he, that, that, he, that didn't change what he wanted them to do. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall what? Inherit what? The earth. Y'all know, y'all know who Jerry Clower is, don't you? <laughs> oh, Uncle Mercy, Jerry Clower. He said, I was a lineman for the Baylor Bears. He said, and I got out there my freshman year, and he said, we was playing the Texas Longhorns. He said, and I stood across the scrimmage line from this guy, and he was looking at me growling like a bear. And he said, I'm supposed to be the bear. And and he said, don't you know I go to Baylor University? And he said, the guy just sat there and looked at him. And he said, we're Baptists. And the guy just sat there and looked at him. And he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he said, the quarterback snapped the ball and just buried my head in the, in the dirt. And he said, I got up spitting and knocking dirt out of my mouth. And he said, that Texas Longhorn looked at me and said, yeah, it says the meek shall inherit the earth and you just inherited a mouthful of it. <laughs> Your perception of Scripture sometimes gets skewed. It gets skewed. <laughs> I'm probably enjoying preaching a whole lot more than y'all are enjoying me. <laughs> I'm having fun. I don't know if y'all are or not. But <laughs> God needs a people with church in their home. Whoa, would that not be different? Now, that doesn't mean you exclude gathering together with the saints. When we talk about church in your home, it's talking about leading your family. We find in... in uh, God in, in the Philippian jailer when he got saved of course he went home and what did he do he said he had the uh, Peter come to speak to his whole family okay 
We need uh, Eunice and Lois and Timothy are the examples in the Bible as, as the grandmother and the mother passed on the, their heritage down to Timothy, the son and the grandson. Are you passing on your heritage down to your children and your grandchildren, your brothers and your sisters? Are they, are they hearing? And then we find the one I really want to focus on is Philemon. In Philemon, some call him Philemon, but I always just say Philemon. I, you can pronounce it how you want to. But you see, he had church in his house in Colossae because there was no church. So they were in Colossians, and so he started the house in his church. Well, there was a, a Philemon had a, 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 a slave whose name was Onesimus. Okay? And uh, now, even in, in New Testament times, they, there were slaves. And the owner of the slave owned everything about that slave. The slave had no rights. They owned nothing and they had no rights. Everything that they did was under the direction of the master. Well, Onesimus, Philemon had gotten saved under Paul's ministry. Onesimus, the slave, ran away. And in running away, he wound up finding Paul. And when he found Paul, Paul led him to the Lord. He got saved. And so Paul then sends a letter back to Philemon and not under his apostle uh, authority. He wasn't trying to say, you've got to do this. But he said, because we're a brother in the Lord and because you are a Christian and you love the Lord, you need to receive Onesimus back as a brother. Well, under the law, he had every right to have him executed. Because he stole. And this, so Paul went so far as to say, and if Onesimus owes you any money, put it to my account. Because most likely Onesimus stole some money when he left because he had to have a way to... And he was a slave. He had nothing. And so the reason I'm saying this, this, is a very, this was very strange character in that day and age for a slave owner to forgive his runaway slave and to cancel his debt. That was peculiar. That was unheard of. But that's exactly what Paul was in, inquiring and wanting uh, Philemon to do with Onesimus and encouraging. So you can read that entire book of, of uh, Philemon. Now, Onesimus, his name means useful and profitable. As long as he was a slave, he was only useful and profitable to Philemon. But now he's free and he can finally live up to his name of being useful and profitable to God. Because he was completely forgiven. I'm no longer a slave to Philemon. <laughs> I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to money. I'm no longer a slave to friends. I'm no longer a slave to relationships. I'm no longer a slave to a world system that cheats me. I'm no longer a slave to a government that cares nothing about me. I'm no longer a slave to a religious system that ostracizes me. I am a child of God. What are you a slave to? Who are you a slave to? I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. You're in exclusive company. You're in exclusive company. You belong to Him. You're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a peculiar person. Woo! That ought to excite you today. My goodness. God needs a people. Not only does He need people who are trained in God's school. Not only does He need a people who have church in their home and, and forgive like this and show the true character of forgiveness. And you learn that in the school of Jesus by studying and, and preparing at home. But thirdly, God needs a people who are anointed. God needs a people who are anointed. And I'm not talking about just when we get to church. If 
we're not anointed through the week, it's going to be hard to be anointed on Sunday morning. And what has hurt the church so much is that people don't spend time with God through the week and they get to church and say, feed me, preacher. Anoint. And you know, preacher, I, I'm just, dep I'm going to depend on the preacher to have all the anointing. Well, fooey on that. I love the anointing, but I can be anointed all day long, and if you sit there like a knot on a log, it's not going to affect you one bit. Come on, preacher, move me. I dare you to move me. Come on, preacher, say something that's going to stir my heart. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. If you got here with the anointing and half the expectation that you had of God that you had of the preacher, you'd get something accomplished. Amen. You expect more from the preacher than you do from God. That's good preaching, Brother Rick. I learned that from somebody. Oh, get off. Again. <laughs> the anointing, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, And after the Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Say it again. Holy Ghost. Say it again. Holy Ghost. Has come upon me. I will be a witness unto Jesus in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. You have a responsibility to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Get that finger and put it on your chest and say, I have a responsibility to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe it? We find in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Robbie's going to put those up there shortly. <laughs> He's doing a good job. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Boy, what does that tell you? And these signs will follow those who believe. Are you a believer? Yes. Say, I'm a, I'm a believer. Say it again, I'm a believer. In my name, who's? The name of Jesus. Not in the name of Rick Vincent, not in the name of Restoration Christian Fellowship, not in the name of Brett Treptal, but in the name of Jesus. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. And what else? They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Do you believe that applies to you? Do you believe that applies to you? Do you believe that applies to you? Yeah. Whew. Whew. Wow. That will win a city to Jesus Christ. That will win our community to Jesus Christ. What I'm preaching today will win your family. How many people do you know that are miserable? You've got the answer. Your answer is exactly what they're looking for. And they don't even realize it. Whew. Paul was anointed to preach. He said, not with excellent speech, but in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. There is power in the gospel to save men. Oh, for the anointing. Oh, for the anointing. God, pray. I pray for the anointing. I pray for the anointing. I pray for the anointing. You'll preach the preacher to death when you get anointed. Am I telling the truth? You get that, you get a preacher, and, a, and where not only is he anointed, but the congregation is anointed, brother. You talk about having church. 
You talk about having church, you'll have church. The anointing. God, fourthly, God needs a people with vision. Now, I'm not talking about, I've already mentioned the Great Commission. I'm not talking about just a vision for the lost because Lord knows, hopefully everybody in here has that vision. But I want to look at it in a different way. God needs a people with a, with a vision where they actually see things that God is doing. Ezekiel had a vision of the valley of dry bones. What did that do to Ezekiel? That drove him into the presence of God. And Ezekiel, the man of God, stood up and he began to speak to dry bones and commanded flesh to come on bones. You talk about a peculiar people. You talking about something strange. Sinew upon sinew, flesh upon flesh, bone to bone, until they stood up and was a living army. And then he commanded the wind to blow, and it blew into them the breath of God, and they became alive. How many of y'all have had a vision like that? What would happen if you did? You think it sets you on fire? Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. You start having visions and dreams. Wait a minute. Isn't that kind of mystic? No, I think Joel 2.28 said, And when the Holy Spirit comes, my young men shall dream dreams, and my old men visions, or vice versa, the old men dream dreams, and young men see visions, and even my handmaidens and daughters shall prophesy. Who is that? Did he leave anybody out? Did he leave anybody out? Did he leave you out? No. Say, he didn't leave me out. He didn't leave me out. That's exactly right. You begin to have visions and dreams, and it'll begin to change your life. It'll change your walk. All of a sudden, it won't be church like usual. It'll be church unusual. You, you won't be able to, you can't wait to get to church to tell somebody about your dream or your vision. And I have people coming up to me that all the time. Dan Wood, he hands me, he writes them down sometimes five, six pages long. I got a whole file in there with Dan Wood's name on it as God is revealing things to him. It's exciting. It's exciting. I got dreams and visions of all of you, people that have given me in there. And one of these days, I'm going to take a service and I'm I'm going to go back and read them. And I want to point something out here. For the last four years that we've been here, we've had prophecies come forth. We've had visiting preachers come in the pulpit. We've had revivalists come in the pulpit. We've had revi uh, pastors come in the pulpit. And they've made this proclamation. The same prophecy has been for said over us. God has His hand on this church. And he said it here to redeem the property. And it's going to be a lighthouse unto my people. Well, I've been praying about that. I said, God, is that true? And you know what he said? Only if you want it to be. And then he said, I'm waiting on you. Mmm. Y'all sound like Balaam's donkey. Only if we want it to. God will prophesy. He will show it to us. But it's in our hands to go with it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because if you don't want it, you may as well find somewhere else to go to church. Because we're fixing to take it. God said we could have it. And we're about to take it. It's going to require commitment from you. So if you ain't ready, you might want to just, you know, mosey on down the road where you can feel comfortable in your little pew and have a little sweet talk with Jesus in the by and by and everything will be okay. No, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be smart at all. We live in perilous times. We live in desperate times. Desperate times require desperate measures. And RCF is fixing to launch headlong and in, in to get this prophecy fulfilled for this church. Now, I'm not going to force God, but God's forcing me. 
The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Are you ready? Are you ready? You still ain't ready. Are you ready? That's ready. Can you imagine? Come here, Thomas. Come here, Brett. We're the football huddle. Now, y'all got, y'all got to play along and know where I'm going here with this. Come on. Okay, fellas. Oh, 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 one, two, three. Let's get it. Let's, one, two, when I say three, let's say five. One, two, three. Five. Five. <laughs> Come on, let's do it again. How many of y'all would support your foot t- football team if they did that? <laughs> All right, here we go again. Here we go again. All right, team. On one, two, three. Let's say five. One, two, three, five. Now, how many of y'all get behind that team? <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence there, Sister Angela. <laughs> Do y'all get what I'm saying? There's got to be some excitement in this church. There's got to be some liveliness in this church. We got to get some meat on these bones. We got to get some air in these lungs. And we got to praise. And we got to worship. And we got to be anointed to see what God's doing. I'm coming. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm about to close. God needs a peculiar people in these last days. We must be people trained in spiritual warfare. We must be a people with church in our home, a people who is anointed and a people of vision. What makes you different from anybody else that you associate with? And can they tell it? What makes Restoration Christian Fellowship different from any other church? The only thing that's going to make the difference is when that anointing falls in this place. And it's so thick, you could cut it with a knife. And you walk out of this place different than you came in Jesus' name. That's where we're headed. Starting today. Starting today. God's already given us the prophetic word that that's what he wants us to be. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The church must take on the personality of the Holy Spirit. And I guarantee you, when the church takes on the personality of the Holy Spirit, we will be different. We'll be different. In closing... The grace of God is something that drives us closer to God. His grace is why we're here where we are. I'm not going to go into that much more because that's a different subject. Do we want to keep hearing the prophecies or do we want to fulfill the prophecies? Do you want to just keep hearing the prophecies and get a chill bump? Oh, guess what God told us today? He said, we're going to be a lighthouse. Well, he's been telling us for four years. Now, I want God to keep speaking to us. But I want to begin to fulfill the things that he's already spoken to us. Bow your heads with me. Paul, would you guys come?